to the Immortal Art Podcast. I'm your host, Eldin. This is episode 35, Art Stories number 4, Statuette of Dolni Bestonice. You can support this podcast on Patreon and Spotify as little as $1 per month. The links are below. Check them out. Subscribe and follow this podcast on your favorite podcast app. You can reach me at the Immortal Art Podcast at gmail.com. If it's not a big of a hustle, rate this podcast or leave a comment. Thank you. I will remind you about the fact about statuette of Dolni Bestonice near Brno in Czech Republic. The extended version of this episode you can listen in episode 31. The link is provided. The statuette, known as Venus of Dolni Bestonice, is a ceremonic figurine depicting a nude female dating back 29 to 25,000 years ago. It stands 10 centimeters in height and 4 centimeters in width at its widest point. The figurine is made of clay, fired at a relatively low temperature of around 500 degrees Celsius. It shares characteristics with other Venus figurines, featuring large breasts, belly and hips, with a relatively small head and minimal detail elsewhere. Originally it had four feathers, evidenced by small holes on the head. It was excavated in a layer of ash in 1925 in the central fireplace, broken into two pieces. Nobody knows why. An x-ray scan in 2004 revealed a child's fingerprint. We don't know why it's made or for whom. I only imagine. In a settlement along a stream, a man named Tarka and his younger daughter Nava lived in a village. The huts were made of mammoth bones and tree branches covered in animal hides. It was a clan of 40 individuals. Tarka and Nava's home stood within the enclosure of bone and stone fence, separating the living space into a distinct inside and outside, offering both protection and sense of belonging, and most importantly, separation between the humans and the rest of nature. In Tarka and Nava's tent, the floor was covered with the fur and pelts of animals that Tarka had hunted with skill and precision. They slept, sat, and ate on these soft bearskins. The hearth burned steadily at the center of their dwelling. The scent of smoke, dried herbs, and meat linger in the air. Every night the glow of the fire danced upon the walls of the tent, casting shadows that seemed to come alive with the flickering light. Tarka was a silent man. He spoke only when it was something important. Nava was sitting by her father all the time, ready to speak with him, but she never initiated the conversation. In Tarka and Nava's tent, There was a sense of calmness, a sanctuary away from the chaos of the world outside. It was a place where memories were made and secrets shared, where the bond between father and daughter grew stronger with each passing day. Their tent may have been small, but it was filled with warmth that transcended the boundaries of time and space, weaving a tapestry of comfort and belonging that enveloped Tarka and Nava, Outside their tent, the settlement was filled with activity. Children played games of chase and hide and seek between the tents, their laughter merging with the sounds of the forest that surrounded them. Mothers preparing meals, the shaman chanted in the solitude within his tent, yet his voice carried for all to hear. Fathers teach their sons how to hunt their spears held high in anticipation of the game that awaited them. Tarka never mentioned teaching Nava about hunting. She secretly wanted to be a hunter. If she only asked, he would teach her, but she never did. She was waiting for him to start a dialogue. The members of the clan hunted big game and they gathered seasonal food, each contributing to the tribe. It was a close-knit community where everybody knew each other well and cared deeply for one another. The entire village was 15 tents, 
bustling with people of all ages, children, parents, grandparents. In Nava and Tarka's hut, there was only two of them. Nava was eight winters old, while Tarka had 35 winters behind him. Nava's mother passed away when she was just four winters old, after a long illness that even their shaman couldn't remedy. Nava sat quietly by the entrance of their tent, her gaze fixed on the horizon where the sun dipped lower and lower with each passing moment. It was the time of the day when Tarka would return from its hunt, yet as the shadows lengthened, there was no sign of him. She couldn't help but wonder, as she often did, about her father's solitary nature. She was worried if he never returns, what will happen to her? In the hush of the evening, as the world around her settled into the symphony of fading light and approaching darkness, Nava found herself grappling with the questions that hunted her for as long as she could remember. Why did her father walk the path of solitude? What thoughts lay hidden behind the mask of his impassive countenance, his eyes betraying nothing of the tumult within? All fathers came to the village after the hunt. And then Nava saw a little dot in the distance. She knew it was her father. Tarka was the last to arrive to the village. He was, as usual, slower than everyone else. When the tribe cut the meat of the mammoth, Tarka was waiting patiently on the side to have his share. The rest of the villagers respected his silence. He took his meat, smiled and thanked them for his share. Then he went to Nava and told her that they will cook it over the fire. Tarka was with his daughter while the settlement loudly proclaimed their presence in the dark night. The rhythms of life, the laughter of children and the conversations enveloped Nava in its embrace. Yet Tarka noticed nothing of his surrounding and remained silent, a solitary figure standing apart from the hunting group or his peers. Every time, as Nava watched the other fathers return from their hunt, their voices raised in conversation, she couldn't help but wonder about companionship that seems to elude her father. She observed how they shared tales of their exploits, their faces animated with the thrill of the chase and the triumph of the hunt. In these dialogues, they mentioned her father being brave, being a good hunter, but Tarka always returned alone, his presence a silent testament to the solitude that was within him. Nava yearned to bridge the distance that seems to separate the clan and her father, to unravel the mysteries that shrouded her father's thoughts and emotions, but she found herself held back by the weight of his silence. She longed to understand why he chose to walk the path of solitude, why he remained aloof from the bonds of kinship and camaraderie that bound their clan together. Did someone hurt him? Did he do something wrong? Was he doing something wrong? It was obvious to Nava that everybody respected her father, that everyone accepted his solitude. When the hunters went to hunt, they would call him to join, and he obeyed them. He knew his duty to the clan. She never saw him hunt. She only heard stories about his bravery. That she did something to him. Nava only wanted to talk with her father. Nava knew that she is herself worthy of her father's respect and acceptance. As Nava's questions about her father piled up, like a stone in a riverbed, she found herself drawn to the memories of her mother, a presence felt but never truly known. Her mother's absence hangs heavy in the air, a distant memory hunting the girl. The medicine woman told Nava that she will meet one day her mother in afterlife, but Nava didn't care nor understood afterlife. She wouldn't hug from her mother. Nava heard stories about her mother, not from her father, from others, and they all told her that she was light in their lives. Her laughter was like a music, 
and her touch was like a warm embrace, but Nava doesn't remember it. The story goes when illness had to come to claim her mother. No amount of shamanic ritual or herbal remedies could steam its relentless tide. Nava watched helplessly as her mother's strength weaned, her spirit fading like a dying flame. She remembered that. When her mother passed away, the shaman had crafted a statue in Nava's mother's likeness, a tribute to her beauty and grace. Nava remembered that too. She took four eagle feathers and put it on the statuette's head. One evening, as the fire crackled and danced in the hearth, Nava approached her father with the statue in her hands. She could see the pain etched into his eyes, the weight of loss bearing down on him like a burden too heavy to bear. With trembling fingers, Nava gently placed the statue before her father, a silent offering of solace and remembrance. But as she watched him gaze upon the figure, with tears in his eyes, a wave of anger and frustration washed over her. In a moment of impulsive defiance, Nava seized the statue and threw it to the ground, shattering it into two pieces. The sound echoed through the tent like a thunderclap. For a long moment, silence hung in the air like a heavy fog, broken only by the rage sounds of their breathing. Slowly, Nava's father gathered the broken pieces of the statue into his arm. As the flames consumed the darkness around them and their shattered dreams, father and daughter stood in the light, united by the shattered sorrow and the fragile purpose of hope. They buried the statue by the hearth of their hut. They were both silent. This is the fourth story about the creation of the artworks from the Paleolithic. As I mentioned it at the beginning of this episode, we don't know anything about the creators of these artworks. We don't know anything about their motives. We don't know their needs to make the statue. Was it only an artistic need and nothing else? We don't know. I hope you liked my imagination of the story behind the creation of this statue. This concludes this episode. I want to thank you for joining and listening. I hope I inspired you. I hope you learned something. The music is performed by my friend Sebastian. You can check his band Cadavra. There is a link below. Enjoy the song. Until next time, goodbye. Mm-hmm.